Another place where we can really make changes, uh, in addition to um, diarrheal diseases and HIV AIDS, is in regard to malaria. Malaria is, you know, is a kind of the gra grandparent <laughs> disease, uh, I guess with tuberculosis, that we're still fighting. We know how to fight malaria. We're, we've gotten pretty good at fighting malaria. We've gotten very good at fighting malaria. But it still occurs in nearly 100 countries worldwide, uh, and it takes a huge toll. Uh, on uh, health and uh, and on uh, the ability to earn a living, uh, particularly uh, in sub-Saharan Africa uh, uh, and in other developing countries in South Asia, uh, more than 200 million people, more than 200 million people suffered from the disease in 2010, and uh, about 650 or 600. Uh, 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 more than 650,000 people died of malaria just a few years ago. The vast majority of people who die of malaria are young children. You can live with malaria. There are ways of you know, dealing with the disease and, and uh, 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 certainly reducing or eradicating its symptoms, but the, the, the hundreds of thousands of people who die, most of them will be children under five. Uh, malaria is preventable and it's treatable. We know it can be eliminated. Um, and we will hear, we have heard in this class from uh, developmental economists and others uh, who talk about some of the ways you can uh, reduce the likelihood of uh, bites from infected mosquitoes uh, and other things we can do to defeat malaria. Um, but the, the combination of malaria and extreme poverty um, is a deadly combination uh, still today. Hello, I am so delighted to be here, and you will be delighted to be here after you hear the wonderful panel that we have for you, um, especially to start off with Congressman Meeks, who is just such an inspiration when you're talking about malaria. Um, it's going to be a real treat to hear from him. My name is Deb Derrick, and I come from the uh, um, uh, Friends for the Global Fight Against AIDS, TB, and Malaria. We represent the Global Fund in Washington, D.C., and uh, for those of you who don't know, the Global Fund is the world's largest health financier. Provides more than $3 billion a year to fight malaria, TB, and AIDS. And again, just delighted to be here and to be at this panel on malaria. So there have been tremendous advances in malaria. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard about this yet, there's been in the last decade or so about a 25% reduction in mortality globally in malaria, even as the world's population has grown. And um, so just without further ado, I'd like to turn to Congressman Meeks, who is a long-term member of Congress. He's a ranking person on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He's also a co-chair of the House Malaria and Neglected Tropical Diseases uh, Caucus. And the first thing that I'd like to say is you are such, when, when you get in front of audiences, you really inspire people um, with your work on malaria. How did you get excited about it yourself? Well, when you know that you can make a difference and you can see that difference and you know that it just takes some hard work and commitment and you can eradicate this horrible disease. We've done it before and we can do it now if we stay focused. And so that excites you when you know that you can see the actual results of your work just by educating people and getting people involved and making sure that people are contributing. You can make a difference. And if, you know, I always say the camera of history is rolling and you want in your lifetime to be able to say that you've seen something different when history goes back. So I want to be able to say that I played a role in eradicating malaria from the planet called Earth. That's awesome. <laughs> and so how do you, how do you inspire uh, members of Congress? Do you walk around and give that same speech on the floor when you're well, at Well, me and my co-chair, what we do, we try to make sure that we have uh, meetings. Uh, but it hasn't been difficult because you know, the world is much smaller today than it was 10, 15, even 20 years ago when we started making sure we wiped it out here in the United States. And I think that you get a sense of really tapping into per a person you know, uh, them being a human being uh, and saying, look, why do we have this disease? Uh, and then you think about the words that you, you know, I think about words that Dr. King, you know, he says injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Well, malaria anywhere is a threat 
to malaria everywhere. And so what we say is it is in our own self-interest to make sure that we wipe it out across the planet. Because when you look at you know, airplanes and other diseases that, that can be transported back and forth, why take the chance? And so we talk and talk, and this is one of the issues, fortunately, and Lord knows we have our partisan issues in Washington, D.C., mm. and we can't agree on much. But one of the areas I can tell you that we've come together and we agree upon, both Democrats and Republicans, and House and the Senate, is eradicating this disease called malaria. Yeah, I would echo that. It has been astoundingly bipartisan in Washington, D.C., which is unusual in Washington, D.C. these days. Thank you very much. Um, we also have with us Miguel uh, Vestergaard Franzen, and he is the CEO and, um, uh, of, of a company by the same name. And Miguel, you had a very interesting introduction to the company and to your work. So when you were young, you, you went to Africa, and how did, what, what happened? Well, so the, the company that is today involved in the fight against malaria, and this is purely private sector, um, actually the history started a little bit before that. I, was, um, I started my first company when I was 19, moved to Nigeria and West Africa and started a company that was doing truck and truck imports and truck engine imports, and did that for about a year. Then there was a military coup, and I was more or less sent packing, came home. My father wanted me to join the family business. At the time, they were doing... Uh, textiles for the Scandinavian market. I was unable to see myself growing old, selling shirts in Sweden, wanting to work with Africa. It got under my skin. It gave me a heartbeat. And so my father, who was very, you know, um, uh, large about um, my, my career and, and future, said, okay, but this is a textile company, so if you want to work with Africa, textiles for Africa. And so this starts, to, to give you some examples of what that is, that is... Um, a sets of fly trap where the key, where the trick is to dye a, a fabric in a certain color so when the sun shines on it, it reflects a ray of exactly 600 and 450 nanometers with the attractive sets of fly. It is a guinea worm filter, which is a nylon cloth that is woven with a specific mesh so that it takes the guinea worm out of river water. And then a good example also is the same technology, the fluorocarbon binder that makes a shirt wrinkle free, is what we're using in the long lasting insecticidal bed nets today. So, um, and so with that, taking the old technology from an old textile company, turning that into a modern company that is, uh, is working at the nexus of doing business and doing good has been a very exciting uh, journey. And what excites you about NETS? Because I know that there has been, for example, there was a, a clinical trial recently where um, there was great excitement around the prospect for a vaccine, but that's going to be some time in the distance. And in the meantime, controlling malaria is really grounded in standard current treatment, including the distribution of nets, which has been phenomenally successful and active recently. So what excites you about nets at this point? Well, I very much agree with Congressman Meeks that it is the results that are so incredibly exciting. Um, in the last, just in the last five years, we've gone from more than a million children dying every year due to malaria to last year close to 700,000. That is, a, of course, 700,000 too many, but it's still a remarkable achievement. And it shows that, it shows two great things, that investing in public health works, uh, certainly investing in malaria works. I'm glad that these results have also been, been a spearhead in, in bipartisan um, uh, success, and, and I'm truly grateful for your leadership. Uh, but it also shows that that investment in global development at large is a success. And, and so this success came about, yes, there is drugs, there is diagnostics, but the success so far has largely been due to the, uh, to the large-scale distribution of the insecticide-treated bed net. And, and just a little anecdote to that, um, our bed net got, in, got endorsed by the World Health Organization in February 2007. That was the same month as Facebook was launched. And uh, up until the end of 2010, we still had more people sleeping on our bed nets than there were users on Facebook. Wow, that's, that's also quite awesome. Is there anything new in the technology that, that is um, especially, again, exciting for you? I think we need to understand that the, um, the gains that we've made are fragile. Uh, of course, that means, for, uh, that means on the technology front that as mosquitoes evolve and become mutant to the, to the insecticides that are used today, we need to develop nets that are smarter. Uh, we have one that is ready that kills insect, uh, mosquitoes that are um, resistant to the known insecticides and is still safe for humans. The data package is ready and we're waiting for the World Health Organization to evaluate it. 
But as we're on the topic of, of fragile uh, success, I think we need to be reminded also that keeping pressure on, uh, on, the, on the funding, on the progress and the gains we've made is so important because if we don't keep the pressure on, malaria is going to uh, research. Right. And we've seen tremendous success. I just recently went to a Global Fund board meeting in Sri Lanka where they had gone from having 260,000 cases of malaria a year about a decade ago to having zero indigenous cases now. So it is a success and it does require continued vigilance too because it can resurface if you don't control it. And certainly, sorry, and certainly when it's the replenishment year for the Global Fund this year, I know that, that this is near and dear to your heart. Uh, they have a target of raising a lot of money, 15 billion, and we, we want to make sure that they're on track. Right. So, uh, finally, we have a terrific story from Edson Kodama and his daughter Naomi, and they um, got involved in, um, in malaria, and in particular, you, Naomi, got involved in a very interesting way. Um, how old were you when you first started looking at or taking action on malaria? Well, actually, uh, my involvement with helping others started before Nothing But Nuts. It was when I was seven years old. Uh, my seventh birthday uh, was December 26, 2004, which was coincidentally the, also the day of the tsunami in Indonesia. And so we were celebrating my birthday and actually saw on the news all these children dying. And I felt in my heart, I did not feel like celebrating the mere seven years of my life when there are children out there who are dying and losing everything that they have that might be my age or younger. And so I told my father that instead of receiving presents that although they might be great, I may not necessarily use them for my benefit. They might just end up thrown in the corner collecting dust. But instead of using that money that they would spend anyway on me getting a present, use this money to save someone's life. Because there's no, no gift that someone can buy for me that is more valuable and more significant than someone's life. That's really also awesome. Yeah. And so, yeah. <laughs> and how old are you now? Uh, I'm 15 now. And you've yes. been doing this every year since and yes. expanding it? Yeah. Uh, I started working with Nothing But Nuts when I was eight, which is a malaria eradication campaign under the UN Foundation. Because um, the following year, I told my dad I wanted to continue helping people. And he talked to me about the UN MDGs, or Millennium Development Goals. And Nothing But Nuts was a campaign under that, helping eradicate malaria. And it was a very simple concept. It was $10, send a net, and save a life. And as an eight-year-old who didn't really understand how much $10 was, it was a simple concept for me to grasp, and a simple concept to share to other people. Great. And Edson, you took that. I mean, you were, you were working, you work with JCI. Yes. And so you help youth do uh, youth organization activities and philanthropic work. How many, uh, how many people do you have in your organization? We and have 200,000 active citizens that we call ourselves members from the age of 18 to 40 years old. We are in 5,000 communities around the world in 126 countries. The active citizenship concept means the members are involved in the problem-solving process. So we just not talk like the Nothing But Next campaign is one of the campaigns we embrace. We try to implement projects in a unique way. Just two weeks ago, we, we ran the, the regatta. It was organized by JSI Netherlands with several countries in Europe. We ran a regatta and raised funds for the Nothing But Nets. We did also, uh, in Japan, we did an agreement with the companies, the vending machines, a couple of cents of every drink the sells in vending machines in Japan goes to Nothing But Net. And we had also the, the Budapest Bamako, which is the JCI version of a Paris Dakar Rally. We load the jeeps and cars with bed nets and run through West Africa to distribute nets and create awareness in the process. And just last week, we have the JCI Boost Tour, JCI USA, create awareness here in the United States. It's not a problem here in the United States in malaria, but we are creating awareness, raising funds, and sending helping lives in Africa. And how much money, pegging off of your daughter's involvement in malaria and nothing but nets, how much money have you raised for nothing but nets? Well, we are close to $2 million wow. uh, as of today. And I believe uh, that we can uh, encourage more people to engage in this process. $10 is so simple. That resonates a lot in our membership. It's similar to the project that she does. Uh, 
is the birthday party. You hold the birthday party. It's so simple. You, you, you don't go to have a, a, a fast food and you can save life. It's, it's something that our members, because of the age range, they have a lot of children. So that $10 each resonates pretty well among our memberships. And finally, I wanted to note about Edson, uh, an interesting story. You were a professional baseball player <laughs> in Brazil? Yeah, I used to play baseball, yes. And <laughs> Long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, nothing but nets helped you fulfill one of your dreams? Yeah, my dream was to play in the major league. And then a couple of months ago in, in St. Louis, before the, the game, St. Louis and Cincinnati Reds, and I throw the first pitch. It was, it was all donation for natural nets, and, and then again, but that was a long time ago. Today, if I throw the ball, the mosquito might stop on, the, on top of the ball. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Congressman, is there anything you'd like to add to it? I mean, in particular, how do you keep people inspired, given that there's a constant crush of questions and issues that come up in Congress? How do you keep people inspired in well, Congress? Well, you know, when you think about it, we all have a responsibility. Uh, you don't get in the public life and just uh, say that you're going to forget about humankind. And as I said earlier, by the world being smaller, you try to demonstrate by leadership. And it, $2 million, if you can raise $2 million, what should we be able to be doing government by government? Not just the United States government, but working collectively together. This is UN week. What could we do if we're talking to our colleagues, you know, and what we do on a consistent basis? Parliamentarians are parliamentarians are trying to make sure that everybody's making a contribution and focused on eradicating uh, malaria. And so we, we try to keep it in the, in the conscious of everyone because it seems to be, uh, though, when you talk about what we have in our humanity collected together, that is something that we should all rally around. You know, you talk about what's taking place in Syria, what the big deal was the chemical weapons being utilized, and the reason why the president wanted to step up was because that was a violation of some human dignities. Well, a violation of human dignities is still young people in the year 2013 losing their life because of malaria. So we've got to keep it in the forefront, keep talking, keep raising money, and letting folks know they can see the benefit of their dollar every day. When you hear the statistics that's being talked about, you know, when you can go down from a million to 700,000, but with just a little extra money, we go from 700,000 down to zero. And that's the goal and the focus that should keep us driving and motivated because we can do it. And we don't know whose lives we're gonna save when we're saving our children because that is the most precious resource that we have on, on this planet. Yeah, and on that front, we've had some great announcements this week. And one of them was that the United Kingdom is stepping up to the plate and it's made a pledge to the Global Fund. That's coming on the heels of the Nordic countries making a terrific announcement of the same, an increased pledge, as we head into this replenishment uh, process. So I just wanted to um, say thank you for your time. Thank you for all that you're doing. And for anybody in the audience who is interested in learning more, um, I would encourage you to go to www .nothing, uh Nothing but, but nets. Nets. Net, net, yes. right? And or www.theglobalfund.org, and you can find out more. And there may be ways that you can help. It's Again, good. the message is. Go ahead. Sorry, because it's really such an easy way to solve this problem. Because right now, if we want to eradicate malaria in Africa, all we need is 400 million nets. And you think about how many people there are in the U.S. If every American donated just two nets, this is just the United States. We could solve this problem completely. Correct. There you go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Infectious diseases is another place where we can really uh, uh, make a difference now. I mean, there are other research programs where we're trying to, you know, cure certain kinds of cancers and things like that, which are really important. But the ones I'm talking to you about now, uh, gastro uh, and uh, gastroendocrinal diseases, that is diarrheal diseases, HIV, AIDS, and now malaria, these are things we know how to deal with right now. And, in, and there are many infectious diseases that still wreak havoc uh, in populations around the world, um, uh, but, but, and, we know, and, we, and we know how to deal with those diseases if we can get the drugs in the hands of people who need them the most. More than one billion people in developing countries suffer from infectious diseases that attract little donor support. I mean, there are some diseases that we all talk about, like malaria, let's say, um, but there are others that get little attention and little funding. 
Um, and more than a billion people around the world suffer from them. And with attention and funding, we know how to combat those diseases. So we're here with uh, Professor Jessica Cohen, who is at the Harvard School of Public Health and talking to us uh, through a, um, some form of advanced technology that I don't understand. And thank you for making time to talk with, with me today. Uh, Professor Cohn is a Wesleyan graduate and uh, has been at Harvard for the last uh, few years. Is that four years? Yeah. Four years. And uh, I thought we'd start off by um, uh, you saying a little bit about your own itinerary. Sure. So thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to see Wesleyan through the. Uh... <laughs> through the webcam. Uh, so at Wesleyan, I was an economics major. Um, I thought that it was one of the best ways to think sort of systematically and rigorously about um, behavior, questions about behavior and society. And at the time, I was interested in sort of very broad, uh, big questions. My thesis at Wesleyan was about, what was it about? It was about the evolution of the reciprocity norm and how people give gifts to one another and how economic institutions influence that type of giving. Very different from what I do now. Uh -huh. I um, went to the Brookings Institution after Wesleyan and worked with a labor economist named Bill Dickens and also with Joe Stiglitz. And um, I got more and more interested in uh, policy approaches to economics. And uh, then the year after went to uh, MIT as a doctoral student in economics. Uh, economics uh, at MIT and in the Cambridge area, um, there's a, there's a, a a burgeoning interest in development economics. Mm -hmm. So using the tools of economics to think about poverty and health and um, agriculture and issues in developing countries that was just starting to get a lot of momentum um, in the early 2000s. And um, I got very excited about the possibilities of development economics at the time. And so I went to Kenya for the summer to work with um, Michael Kramer and Esther Duflo, mm -hmm. who were founding members of the Poverty Action Lab. <laughs> At the time, I worked on a project that was looking at how to get farmers to adopt fertilizer, actually. Uh -huh. So the starting project, the starting point for the project was, why hasn't there been a green revolution in Africa? The way that fertilizer transformed um, agriculture and poverty in India, um, fertilizer was available. You know, even in small, it's divisible. So even in small quantities, farmers could afford it, right. but they weren't buying it. They were sort of leaving dollars on the ground. And so what was the reason for that? So I was there for an early phase of this project that went on for years and is actually a great example of the type of work that um, the Poverty Action Lab and other development economists um, uh, like me do these days, which is a form of searching. So mm -hmm. trying to understand why um, certain poverty traps exist and right. health traps exist and experimenting with solutions to get out of it. Um, and so we can come back to sort of what was explored in that fertilizer project. Um, and so I spent the summer shucking corn and learning <laughs> how to do randomized trials in developing countries. And at the time, um, so this was a part of Kenya that has incredible burden of malaria. Um, so in this part of Kenya and in much of many parts of sub-Saharan Africa, malaria is like the ear infection that, you know, among kids in the U.S., malaria is like that for kids in, in Africa. It's just a chronic, chronic burden. It's a leading cause of death among mm -hmm. children under five and a major source of morbidity uh, for pregnant women also because of compromised immunity. And it's very, very common. So in this part of Kenya, people could expect uh, a few episodes a year at least. Um, and at the time, the um, interventions to help prevent malaria were not um, very, um, very widely available. Mm -hmm. So um, another um, economic student, Pascaline Dupin, I um, thought that it would be a great idea to distribute uh, insecticide-treated mosquito nets, which right. are um, one of the most powerful weapons against malaria. Um, 
they hang over a sleeping space and protect you from um, mosquitoes that bite you in the middle of the night, which are the type of mosquitoes that transmit um, the lethal form of malaria, falciparum malaria. And um, targeting these nets to pregnant women seemed like a particularly good idea because it's pregnant women and their newborns that are most vulnerable to, um, to death from this disease and um, also pregnant women need to sleep under a net um, to um, avoid low birth weight and other birth complications. So we started a little NGO called TomTom, Tom, Together Against Malaria, twice, uh-huh. um, and uh, where we distributed free mosquito nets through prenatal clinics. Right. And part of the condition from some of the early donors was we needed to evaluate this strategy. Um, and so what we did was we set up a very small evaluation that looked at if you provide insecticide treated nets through prenatal clinics, mm-hmm. um, when women are coming for prenatal care, does that increase attendance at prenatal care? So does it is it successful at getting women to come earlier? I see. Um, more frequently. Um, And the idea was that there would be like a nice, um, um, a nice, um, what do you call it? Synthesis between um, increasing prenatal care and also preventing malaria. So we did that and it was a small NGO and it was a nice uh, little study and we found that it did indeed increase um, prenatal attendance by a lot. But about a year after that, Um, a very large NGO named Population Services International um, started working with the government of Kenya to distribute prenatal uh, uh, insecticide-treated nets throughout uh, Kenya. And um, since then, insecticide-treated nets have been scaled up throughout Africa. It is the main reason why malaria deaths, one of the main reasons why malaria deaths have dropped by a third over the last 10 years. Um, They are just hugely effective at controlling this disease. And um, so they came in and they, um, we said, you know what, they have it covered. We'll go work in somewhere else. We don't need to duplicate efforts. The difference, though, is that um, this organization and the government of Kenya was charging something for the ah. net. So we had been giving them for free. And this organization represented the views of a lot of countries and NGOs where the, the idea was that you have to charge something in order for these nets to be valued. So nets are about 6 or $7, much more than a lot of people in these areas can afford. So there's an understanding that they need to be cheaper. But... The argument is that if you give them away for free, people will just not use them. So there were anecdotes abound Hmm. uh, that people use them for fishing, they use them for wedding veils, and that this was a perfect example of the waste that's inherent in global aid. I see. uh, Aid for health. That if you give them for free, they'll just end up being used for fishing nets. If you charge 75 cents for them, right, people can still afford them, but you sort of eliminate the people who will take them just because they're free, but they wouldn't use them. So this was like a great idea. So there was a so what we found was that um, when they started doing this, that prenatal attendance went back down to very low levels, really to lower levels. And that got us thinking, wow, could there really be that big of an effect of charging 75 cents for a net? I mean, a net that these people really needed, right? There was tons of malaria, clear benefit, clear economic benefit, right? Because you can work if you don't have malaria, clear health benefit. Could it really be that it mattered that much to charge right. that? So we went back. This was part of my senior thesis. Uh, so my senior thesis, my doctoral dissertation. Right. And we did a, an experiment where we looked at the effect of charging 75 cents for a bed net relative to giving them for free. And we looked at a few prices in between. So the idea was just like the way you would do a clinical trial for medicine or surgery, we did a randomized controlled trial to compare policy A to policy B. Does it make sense to give them for free? or to charge something. And the starting point was that while it may be the case that um, when you charge something, people are more likely to use it um, and to value it, you could be sort of cutting your nose to spite your face yes. because people are poor and you know, you're shut, you know, your, your, your um, objective is to increase coverage by a lot. Right. And so what we did was we compared a few things, but the main things were How many pregnant women get a net when you charge something? How many get it when it's free? And how many then are sleeping under it and using it 
a month later that we looked at that through home visits. And what we found was a tremendous amount of price sensitivity. So if 100 women take a free net, right. 40 of them will pay 60 cents for it. And 25 of them will pay the, the, um, the price that the government of Kenya was charging. So in other words, they were losing 75% coverage right. in order to get back a 10% of the cost of this net, right? And on the other hand, there was no difference in the chances that a woman was sleeping under the net if she bought it, you know, if she took it for free or if she paid the highest price for it. Right. So the implication was that it makes no sense at all to charge small user fees for bed nets. Um, what you're what you're losing, um, it, you're not making up for at yeah. all in terms of what. And that was the beginning of a change in policy that contributed to a change in policy in Kenya toward free distribution of these nets. And also was part of a mounting evidence that these small fees for these essential health products are counterproductive. And Jeffrey Sachs, who you're talking to later, will probably tell you something similar. Um, and so that's sort of that was sort of my path and it's led me to um, this work on impact evaluation and this sort of approach to um, development and poverty which thinks about sort of searching for the right um, policy or program.